Saudi Arabia's penchant for stifling political dissent and freedom of expression is not exactly breaking news, nor are Riyadh's armies of online trolls and bots patrolling Twitter. However, there is a court case unfolding in California that reveals just how far the Saudi government is willing to go to watch its critics and to silence them. Two former employees at Twitter have been charged with acting as Saudi agents back in 2015 and working with the authorities in Riyadh. Given Saudi Arabia's treatment of dissidents, the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi being a notorious case in point, those Twitter agents may well have exposed other Saudi activists to real danger. Unlike China and Iran, Saudi Arabia allows Twitter to operate on its territory, partly because Twitter is a surveillance tool. It's a hunting ground that the authorities use to find, suppress, and prosecute voices they disapprove of. But this story isn't just about Saudi Arabia. It raises some serious issues about Twitter working with questionable political actors, sacrificing its stated principles for the sake of its bottom line. Our starting point this week is Riyadh. Any story about Twitter, Saudi Arabia, and the way the authorities there deal with the platform begs a simple question. Why do the Saudis even bother? They rank near the bottom of the Reporters Without Borders annual Freedom of Expression Index, along with the likes of China and Iran, countries that simply ban Twitter. And it's not as though the Saudis, under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, have been shy about using censorship. The Saudis could have banned Twitter. They could have done what China has done, what Iran has done. Instead, they've chosen a different strategy. Why? First, he wants to use Twitter uh, as a propaganda machine, and he knows that Saudi Arabia has the highest use of Twitter in the world. The second reason is because he wants to catch people who use social media, and if you ban it, you're not going to find them. So he infiltrates Twitter and catches those people. And finally, Mohammed bin Salman is trying to show that Saudi Arabia is a modern country. If he bans Twitter, he will appear as a dictator. And remember, the outside world is extremely important for his vision 2030 because part of that vision is to attract global investors. They would not allow Twitter to exist in Saudi Arabia if they could not control it. What this allows the Saudi government to do, rather than censor, is to co-opt and influence the information space. The Saudi government have somehow been able to weaponize Twitter as a platform that allows them to spread their influence as hegemony. Yes, these tools allow for freedom of speech and criticism, but if you want, you can use those tools equally for, as a method of surveillance and propaganda. The story and recent court case bringing all of this to light goes back to 2015. It's taking place in San Francisco, not far from Twitter's Silicon Valley headquarters. Two of the company's employees, Ali Al-Zabara, a Saudi citizen, and an American, Ahmad Abuamo, are charged with acting as agents for a foreign power, Saudi Arabia, while inside the U.S. The accused were well positioned to get access to Twitter's internal systems, allowing them to see the email addresses, phone numbers, and IP addresses of Twitter users critical of the Saudi government. By allegedly furnishing the Saudi authorities with that information, they exposed those account holders, ending their anonymity, and according to the charges, putting thousands, including Saudis and Americans, at serious risk. We know the case of Turki al Jasser, who is a, a, a local journalist who used to run an influential Twitter account uh, with, by the name of Kashkul. His identity was revealed by these spies on Twitter, and he's been arrested. There are news that he, he, has, he has been killed under torture. We cannot confirm or deny that. Depending on the internet infrastructure of a country, often the case in the Gulf is that if you know someone's IP address, you can find their physical location. So if you find an anonymous account, for example, that's criticizing the Saudi government, and you have a mole who tells you their IP address, you would be able to send police to the location of that house and arrest people. Doesn't mean you always get the right person, but it's not really relevant, you know, they could arrest the whole family. So that could have been deployed 
The regime is strong. It has invested in surveillance technology in order to hack accounts of uh, dissidents and activists, tarnishing their uh, reputation abroad. Mohammed bin Salman is so sensitive to any critical voice who tweets in English because it targets the audiences he wants to win. The disappearance of Turki al Jasser revealed how the Saudis used Twitter to police within the country and gave birth to the hashtag Twitter killed Turki al Jasser. Omar Abdulaziz, a Saudi activist and satirist living in Canada, is an example of how the Saudi surveillance state extends beyond its borders. Abdulaziz says personal information that Twitter had on him was turned over to Riyadh then used by operatives to target his computer with state-of-the-art spyware and malware made in Israel. What the information that you can gain from Twitter would allow, whether it's email address, phone number, or IP, is a better way to target those dissidents with spyware. If you have their email, you can do some social engineering, uh, deliver some malware to them via a convincing lie. Uh, similarly, you can do that with an IP address or a phone number. So those information points are key because they allow the state in question, the Saudi government, to refine the ways in which they might try to compromise further the devices belonging to any dissidents. By the end of 2015, American investigators had informed Twitter of the Saudi spies within its ranks. Six months later, the company's CEO, Jack Dorsey, met with the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. But according to multiple reports, the Saudi infiltration of Twitter, which Dorsey knew about, did not even come up. In June of 2016, Twitter's CEO Jack Dorsey met with the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Given what we know now, and given that reportedly there was no discussion at that meeting of the breach, what do we make of that meeting and that photo op? I think it's a clear example of how financial interest, uh, the promise of investment in Twitter, um, took precedence over human rights. In their desperate desire to attract funds to their companies, they are actually creating a bigger problem. And they will realize later that a policy that uh, prioritizes financial gain at the expense of human rights is futile. Jack Dorsey is the CEO of Twitter. There is no way that a competent CEO would not be aware of such a, an important thing as a security breach within his company. It's huge, especially when that breach could have violated US law. It would be the first thing on any meeting agenda. So there's no way you could have that discussion without raising this issue. Uh, it's, it's, it's paramount. Unless Dorsey felt the issue was off limits. A Saudi royal, the Crown Prince's cousin, Al-Walid bin Talal, already owns part of Twitter, and publicly traded companies tend not to bite the hands that invest. Twitter's approach to politics in the region is also reflected in its decision to base its Middle East operations in Dubai. Like the Saudis, the Emiratis have a lamentable record on freedom of expression. There is a suspicion widely held that Twitter basing its Mideast hub in the Emirates explains why so many accounts in the region dealing in political content or human rights get suspended with little or no explanation or recourse. As for Jack Dorsey, neither he nor his company get the kind of scrutiny Mark Zuckerberg does at Facebook. They are different platforms, they do different things, and they have different issues but they both have a lot to answer for. Jack Dorsey is not a human rights champion. He is a businessman who is interested in making money. And if making money involves sharing information on other people, sure, he will do it. Facebook did it, YouTube, Google, um, other American and Western companies who sell arms, for example. What's the difference between Twitter and Raytheon, who sells these missiles to killing a you many children? Nothing. It's just this one is businesses and social media. The other company makes bombs and missiles. But the bottom line is the same. We are here to make money.